Very good. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the next lecture, the fourth week, I guess, of the course. Um, well, yeah, the fourth week. Right. So, um, last lecture, we started sort of the information theoretic part of, of the course by talking about Maxwell's demon. The takeaway point from that lecture was that information itself has a thermodynamic meaning. You can trade it off. If you have information at your, at your disposal, you can trade it for extracting heat and converting it into work. And conversely, if you um, have work at your disposal, you can dissipate it into a heat bath and, as a result, gain information um, out of it. All right. Um, one question that a number of you have asked, uh, I made yesterday two sort of, uh, not yesterday, last uh, week, two arguments for the Maxwell's demon. One of them was hand-waving. I talked about really the state of the memory is the zero and one, the qubit, for example. And I went through this process of using reversibility to argue what should happen. At the end, there was a step which was not easy to argue in a hand-waving manner, which was to say that the, the final state, oh, that's way too small, the final state um, should be um, identity of the system over two, tensor identity of the memory over two. And the argument for why this should be the case is, is a bit tricky. Um, and really, the only way to prove it in full generality is what I did in the second part, where I really took the formal proof. I said, take a density matrix for everything. And, and the result is that then this cannot be, it cannot be the state um, just zero memory. And the reason is because we ended up with this equation, delta SM is greater or equal to um, the k to the log 2, or sorry. The, the, here we have the work, um, the heat to work, heat to work amount. So if I, if I convert heat into work, the memory had to increase by a certain amount of entropy. So that was really the reasoning for that. So the hand-waving explanation there does not suffice. It, it sufficed for the first part where I argued that the memory has to begin in a pure state because that just has, that just you argue from the fact that when you do a measurement using a memory, then reversibility means that you cannot accurately record the measurement result unless you start from a pure state of the memory. Okay, now, um, right, so to sort of revisit what we did in the last lecture, um, at the end, we got this statement, delta SM is greater or equal to something, and it was the first example of sort of a second law of thermodynamics that we have in this course. We've already had one version when we talked about passivity, but that was just a no-go theorem. You, you have a certain type of energy, the energy stored in completely passive states, which you cannot convert into work. So that was a no-go theorem. This is a more quantifiable one because it really links many different quantities to each other. And so I want to really to briefly discuss what the ingredients of such a second law derivation are, because there, there is a huge amount of literature in quantum information and thermodynamics community, and a lot of it can be branched together as, oh, it's just another version of the second law. And the ingredients are the following. First of all, you have reversibility. So you know that because physics is the way it is, if you include everything that is involved in your protocol and whatever you're doing, at some global level, you should see that it's reversible dynamics. So in the case of quantum mechanics, this is the same as unitarity, but you can also discuss this for classical thermodynamics, and it's the same. You have to have that everything is a one-to-one -one transformation. This also implies that the entropy difference globally is zero. It's the same thing as saying that. Okay. The second ingredient of the second law is that you start with a state that had no initial correlation. So remember, we started with a product state. Um, and this is just to say, well, if you start with something that has correlations and you have information at your disposal. So if you did do that, you could still get the second law. You would simply have to ensure that you accounted for that information. But the cleaner way of doing it is to say, I just start with a state with no initial correlations. We will, in the next lecture, discuss cases where you start with something that has correlations and you see how it affects it. Specifically with quantum correlations, you can get things that you would not get with classical correlations. So we will discuss erasure under those conditions. But this is one of the ingredients, either no initial correlations or you take account of them. The third ingredient, and this is where we get the inequality part, is the sub-additivity of entropy. We always have that when we do have a joint state of many components, the sum of the marginal entropies is greater than the joint entropy. By the way, um, a number of you asked the question about mutual information, because I think in QIT, most of the time, you took the mutual information just across, you, you divided everything into just two parts. 
you can of course do this uh, even with more than two systems as I did in the last lecture. You, whatever partition you make with how many ever components, you're always going to have the statement that the sum of the marginals is greater than the joint. So this is a statement that's true. And then the final thing, so the first three things is sufficient to give you some sort of inequality relationship, but the final part to make it all a thermodynamic statement is to associate heat and work with something. So it, you always have one component that acts as a source of heat. And what does that mean? It means that it obeys Jane's principle. So whatever energy that you exchange with it, the delta E of the system is going to be related to delta S of the system by this amount. And that's Jane's principle. And then something that we didn't discuss explicitly, but we hope to get at the end of today's lecture, is work. So you typically will have another system which has a property that whatever energy you exchange with it, its entropy does not change. So its energy changes without any changes in the uncertainty of its state. And that is a work system. So if you put these four ingredients together in any protocol that you come up with, you're end up going to end up with some inequality that tells you, well, this is what the second law of thermodynamics looks like in this case. All right. Any questions? All right. So all of this was... Um, yeah, so this, was, this is the second law. The second law, of course, is, a, is another version of a no-go theorem. I cannot do something. But now I want to discuss the converse. I want to discuss, well, what can I do? And we're going to discuss it for the simple case that I have a qubit. And we're going to start now with a degenerate qubit. So we have a degenerate qubit. And I have rho system. So rho, yeah, so rho system initially is equal to a maximally mixed state, so it's half plus one, one on the system. And I want the final state of the row system, so the final one, to go to a pure state zero, zero on the system. So degenerate qubit means that E of the system is equal to zero. Both of the energy levels are the same. So this is, this is what I call erasure. So let me just, so this here is, oh, that's very bad. The reason it's called erasure is because from last lecture, we, we saw that when you, when you make a measurement using um, a state of the memory, so let's say I use, I use the system as a, as a measurement de uh, device, then I start out with, with it in a defined state, and then it gets entangled with the state of whatever I'm measuring. And as a result of the entanglement, the reduced state of the system becomes mixed because it, it becomes by a C naught gate, it would be zero times zero of the other thing I'm measuring plus one times one, which is pure, but then I take the trace, I get this one. So erasure is basically saying, I've used this already, now I want to reset it so that I can use it again. That's why it's called erasure. I've taken away the results of previous measurements. Okay, um, right. Now, the reason I said it goes to and it doesn't, equal to this is because actually this transformation itself is impossible. So it, you cannot go exactly to that. And now this is um, the first case of looking at the third law of thermodynamics, which as we go through this lecture, we will discuss in different ways. And there are many ways of talking about the third law of thermodynamics. Typically, the one that you hear in classical thermodynamics is cooling to absolute zero. But um, in a certain sense, in the quantum case, it's, it's, the, um, it's like a purity um, is impossible. So the impossibility of preparing pure states. So let's not say purity, but pure states are impossible. Sorry. And I can make an argument very simply for this. Let's say I have rho of bath tensor rho of system, which is that rho of system. And rho of bath, remember, is some Gibbs state, so it's e to the minus beta h bath upon the partition function. And now I do a unitary operation on this, you, you dagger. Okay, this is my typical thing I can do. Now, what do I have here? Rho system is a state of full rank. So both of these states are full rank. Full rank. Now, what does full rank mean? Um, this is the same as in linear algebra, independent rows and columns. In this case, you can think of it basically as there are no zero eigenvalues. Every eigenvalue is non-zero. Row bath is also full rank. 
because every one of the eigenvalues is is e to the minus beta times an energy, and as long as the energy, well, the energy is not infinite formally, so there are always going to be numbers. They can be small or large, but they're always going to be non-zero. So I start with a full rank state. This joint state has no eigenvalues that are zero. And I do a do unitary operation, which you know, it can rotate eigenvectors, but the spectrum of eigenvalues remains the same. So this operation here, now, I want it to go to row system prime being that one. And now the the nice property of having a pure state is, if this is a pure state, then I already know it has to be something of this form. Robot prime, tensor, zero, zero system. I don't actually have to say that only the reduced state is this, because when the reduced state is a pure state, that means you are in a product state. Okay. But the problem here is this is now rank one. And this is, I mean, this can be whatever rank it is, so it's rank is less or equal to the dimension of the bath. Let's say dimensional bar. But now we have a problem. The rank of this joint state, so the total rank, is equal to two times the dimension of the bath. Because this was full rank, and this is full rank, so it's two times the dimension of the bath. But here, the total rank is less or equal to the dimension of the bath. But this is impossible. So this is basically not a possible transformation. You cannot start from a full rank state, do a unitary operation, and decrease its rank. And so what this means is that you can never actually go to this, to actually the pure state. So instead, what you do is you actually go to epsilon within the pure state. And this basically means, so this is to say that there are many ways of doing it. You can just say the trace of um, the, the distance between them, um, rho system prime minus the state 0, 0 is less or equal to epsilon. And this can be any distance measure. So okay. Right. So this is now the first example of the third law of thermodynamics that you see. You cannot get to pure states. Let me now practically demonstrate this with actually trying to do erasure using an operation that we've already discussed, which is the qubit swap. Um, let me erase that at the end. OK, so this is something that you've already discussed, I think, in the the complicated tutorial question that you had on, on majorization. So I'm going to do the simplest version of it. I'm going to draw the Hamiltonians now. My qubit is degenerate. So this is the Hamiltonian of the system. OK, degenerate qubits. And what I can do is I can swap it with uh, this. I can swap it with the Hamiltonian of a bath. So this is HB. So I start with rho system tensor tau b, the um, thermal state of the bath. And then I do the swap. And so I end up with tau tensor rho on the two of them. This is now on the system, and this is on the, on, but it's, OK, it's, it's tau, which is the initial state of the bath, but it's not a thermal state of the qubit. It's just what the, qubit, the um, thermal state of the bath was first. Now, what is going to happen here? So I, we know from the qubit swap that whatever the state of the bath was, it's going to be here. So I can just look at the property of the states of the bath. I know that because this is a thermal state, the population of the ground state is going to be 1 upon 1 plus e to the minus beta eb. And this d1 is going to be e to the minus beta eb upon 1 plus e to the minus beta eb. And so what happens is I've gone from a maximally mixed state to the, the state there, which is well, one of say zero, zero system with one upon z, that thing is z, plus e to the minus beta eb upon z, one, one of the system. Now, so this is partial erasure. This is partial 
I have gotten closer to the state that I want from the maximally mixed state, though not all the way. Now, how do I get full erasure? If I consider, okay, I'm going to do this, is there any way to make this full erasure? Well, the only way to do that would be to make the component of one equal to zero. And the only way to do that is to send EB going to infinity. So limit EB goes to infinity of rho s prime is, in fact, equal to 0, 0, s, which is fine. It does not contradict this because it's a limit. So you don't, you're never actually going to get there. You can get as close as you want, but you're always going to stay full rank because there's always going to be a small amount of population left in the one state. OK, but now we want to see something else. We want to see, well, what is the energy that I've spent by doing this operation? Right? So I, I have the system and the bath. Its energy is going to change as a result of this operation, and I want to see what the energy changes as. Now, where does the energy change come from? The system is, is degenerate, so whatever population I switch between the states, it doesn't matter. So the energy change comes only from the bath. So I want to look at now the uh, delta, well, so I, I'm going to call it W, which in our case here is just delta E of the bath. And what is this? Well, I'm going to treat the ground state as zero energy. So the only change in energy is because of the, um, the change in the excited state of the bath. So that's equal to, um, so it's EB times the final population of the bath. The final state of the bath is just the initial state of the system. So it's half and half minus um, e to the minus beta EB upon 1 plus e to the minus beta EB. But this is also actually, in fact, just EB times delta P of the system, I can, I can call this, which is basically the change in population, change in the system, system uh, population of, of either state. It will just be minus or plus, depending on the ground excited. In this case, we take it to be the um, increase in population in the ground state. That's going to be delta PS. Okay. So now I, now I want to do the same thing. I say, well, what is limit EB tends to infinity of W? And I will get, well, delta PS is a finite quantity. It's basically between half and, and zero, essentially, because the ground state increases its population from starting from half, and it gets closer and closer to one as, you, as EB tends to infinity. So this quantity is basically within half and zero, but EB diverges in the case where I'm going towards full erasure. So I get infinity. And so this is now another version of the second, third law. If you, if you think about it, this is now, again, a third law type statement, which is basically to say, well, so the first the third law statement was you, you cannot actually get to zero. But the next thing to say now is, if you try to do it in this case with just a single qubit and a single unitary operation, you could get a, as close to zero as you wanted, but it would come at the cost of infinite energy. You would have to spend infinite energy to make this unitary transformation happen. Okay. Now, you may ask the question, is this always going to be the case that if I try to cool to absolute zero, I'm going to spend infinite energy? The answer is no, because energy is not the only resource. The other resource is the resources that are involved, and this is something I will return to, is one is the complexity of the operation. Here, this is the simplest operation possible. It's a qubit interacting with a qubit. And the second is the number of times I do unitary operations interspersed with other, like, thermalization and reset. Because remember, in the qubit swap lecture, you also had the the concept of swapping, then resetting, then swapping, and resetting, and this is now a repetition. And so those number of repetitions and the complexity of each operation are also resources, and you can trade them off towards energy. We will see this in the class. So any question? All right. Let me send this up. OK. So um, one thing that we see uh, from that example is it does erasure. It does some sort of erasure. It manages to get us closer to the, the state that we want. But clearly, the work cost diverges. And this is a problem because we know from Maxwell's demon that it does not have to diverge. If we looked at, so for the qubit case, for qubit erasure, we know that the work cost must be greater or equal to kt log, well, kt delta s, which if I start in that case is kt log 2, or, or I'll just write it as kt delta s as well, okay? 
But this is a finite amount, and that one is diverging, so clearly what we've done there is very inefficient. There must be, or we hope that there is a, a better way of doing it. And the reason that it is inefficient is, you remember from our last class, we had all of these terms with, um, let's say, delta S um, of the system, of the memory, et cetera. And on the other hand side, we had greater or equal to something, but the equality form was something plus, there were two terms, one was the mutual information, so S, M, B, and one was the, the change in ent uh, relative entropy of the bath. Okay, so I'll just, I'll write the form for the situation that they're doing, because we don't have a memory, we just have the system now. So let me just write it for the system alone. If we just have the system and the bath, then I'm going to have that the work cost is greater or equal to uh, KT, ooh, ah, because of the thing, KT delta S of the system, um, so it's equal to, plus the mutual information of, ah, second, yeah. All right, so I've learned that when the cleaning liquid is still fresh on the board, it's not possible to write. There you go. Delta W is equal to KT, delta S of the system, um, plus, and this is now the, this is in, incidentally the decrease in delta S here, plus the mutual information system bath, plus D rho bath prime versus rho bath. Okay? So I've done the same thing, but I just said that there was no memory. So it's the same thing as last lecture, just the memory is missing. So instead of mutual information system memory and bath, I just have these two terms now. Okay, and so this gives us a hint as to what goes wrong there. The advantage of doing a qubit swap is that this term is zero. So this is equal to zero for full swaps. Even if it was a multi, a high dimensional thing, if we have two states and we fully swap them, the mutual information is zero because we simply exchange the labels, nothing has changed with the, if, if you start in a product state as we did there, you stay in a product state, it's just switched order. So the only thing that is, um, that changes is this one here. So this is the most important quantity for us. And this, we can see that it changes a lot. My state of the bath starts from something that, if I take EB to be very large, the state of the bath is very close to being in the ground state. But then after doing the swap, it becomes very close to being in the, in the maximally, well, it becomes equal to being in the maximally mixed state. So the state of the bath has changed a lot. And this is highly irreversible. It's sort of the opposite of being isothermal. Remember from classical thermodynamics, isothermal is where your system interacts with the bath, but as it's interacting and changing, it sort of remains thermal with the bath. But this is the opposite case. Your system is very different from the bath state, and therefore you had irreversibility. So what do we want to do? We want to make it reversible. So we want to make D rho B prime versus rho B be small which is the same as saying that, so rho b prime has to be, if rho b prime has to be close to rho b, but we know rho b prime is, under qubit swap, is exactly the same as rho s, this is basically saying that d of rho s versus rho b is also small. And so this is what we do now. We say, okay, we have a degenerate system, and, uh, let's, yeah, okay. I'm gonna draw the swap now in a slightly different manner. So I draw my, HS of the system here, and this is HB, okay? And I want HB, so I know that um, if I take the energy gap of the bar to be large, it's going to be further and further away from the maximum X state, so what I do is I take HB to be something with a very small gap. Okay, so very, let's, um, let's call it, oh, this is, it's a small gap, but I shouldn't write as small, <laughs> D. Okay. As a result of this, what's going to happen is my, my bath um, state is going to have a very small energy gap. So in all of those calculations there where I did, so e to the minus beta times eb is going to be a number that's close to one. And therefore, the, while it is biased towards being in the ground state, it's biased very little. So this swap now, if I do this swap here, it's going to have a much smaller value of d. Uh, the difference between the final state and the initial state of the bath. 
However, of course, it also gets us only one small step towards erasure, because now that the state of the system has also changed very little. So what we do then, now that the system has become what the state of this part was, we repeat this. So then we go on. And then we have a second bath system. So we have HP, this and this. So this is B2. And you do another swap here. And then you just repeat this. Dun, dun, dun. So you keep on swapping with increasing energies of the bath. And at the end, you will have some finite energy of the bath. So this is B. N, let's say. So now I've labeled B by a little subscript to say the system one, two, three, four, so on from the bot. And so you have N steps here. And there's a final swap here. Okay. And now we want to see what happens in this protocol here. This is now the protocol of, um, so we call this, this is now reversible erasure, which we will prove that is actually reversible erasure in the sense that what we get is close to the optimal. Okay. Right. Okay, so let's look at the result of what we get in this protocol here. So the first thing we do is we have a final state. Let's, we can pick the final state of the bar to be the same as we tried in the initial example where we just did the qubit swap. So I can still get that rho s final or rho s final, which also I can write it as rho s at the nth step. So now I use the upper brackets to be to denote the number of steps. So that is equal to so that rho um, uh, rho b n, if you will, the final state of the path. Okay. But what I would like to do now is to calculate what the work cost is in the beginning, because I've seen now that on my system, I mean, I've done something complicated in, in between, but the end result on my system is a transformation that I was aiming to do in the first case just by doing one swap. So that remains the same. The only thing that changes now is that instead of sw swapping with one bath, I do the swap with many states of the bath, and so clearly something has changed here. So we would like to see now what is W total. So now W total is going to be equal to I can write it as a sum from n is equal to 1 to n of wn. And the same thing here, wn is the work change in the n step of, the, of this protocol. So it is the, the change in energy that we had at the n step of the protocol. OK. And what does every step in this protocol do? Well, every step in this protocol, so I will now write actually the n step. So what do I have? Before the end step, row system at, let's say, uh, so row n is after the end step. So row n is after the end step. So row n minus 1. OK, so this is what I have before the, the end step. So n, so let me clarify this a bit. Row n minus 1 state prior to step n, or to swap n, OK? So the state there is row system n minus 1, tensor um, tau bn, OK? And this is basically equal to, let's say, tau n minus 1. Because what I do in this protocol is that I keep swapping the system with the bath. So before I've swapped it with the nth state of the bath, its state is the previous swap that I did. So it's this, the n minus 1 state of the bath. So this goes to rho um, system n, and which is now going to be tau n, sorry, uh, tensor. And the state of the bath now becomes rho system n minus 1. So I can, I can write this also as tau n on the system tensor row system n minus 1. Okay. So why do we do this? We do this because we want to see what happened to the bath. Okay. And the bath has basically changed. And this is now the same as tau n minus 1. So we see that the, the change on the bath in the n step is very simple. You simply change the state of the bath from the nth state of the bath to the nth minus 1 state of the bath. 
That's all that happens. It's basically, this whole thing is like a cycle where you, you, you shift every, every state of the bath one forward, you shift the final state of the bath on the system and the state of the system on the first one. So you can treat it as one big rotation, essentially, of all of the states, like a cycle of the states. OK, so this is what happens in one state, uh, one step of the thing. We want to look at the change in, in, in the work. In order to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to look first at what the change in the entropy is. So what is delta S of the system and delta S of the bath? Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that they are approximately equal. Well, actually, sorry, they're not approximately equal. They're e exactly equal. <laughs> they're equal um, with a negative sign. So delta S of the system is minus delta S of the bath. And the reason is because I do a qubit swap. So whatever the state of the, si well, they are product state and they simply shift state. So whatever the entropy of one has increased by, the entropy of the other has decreased by. So I can interchange these two things. And now I can calculate what the entropy change of the bath is. So what is delta S of the bath? And here I use uh, Taylor expansion. So I'm going to use the fact now that I've split this into very small steps. And by doing so, I've changed the population of the, of the system in, in each step very, by a very small amount. So this is going to be equal to ds by dp oops, times, let's call it delta p, plus something that is of the order of delta p squared. So this is just the Taylor expansion. First, the linear term, and then the whatever the rem remainder is, we know that it's, it's off the order of delta p squared. Formally speaking, what this means is I can always upper bound it by some constant times delta p squared. So that's the thing. All right, so what is ds by dp? Now, what, do I, what is p? I'm going to say that p is ground state population. OK? So ds by dp, now this is straightforward calculation. Um, d by dp of minus um, p log p log p plus 1 minus p log 1 minus p, um, which is minus uh, 1 plus log p minus 1 minus log 1 minus p. Um, so this whole thing now is just log of p upon 1 minus p and this is now important. This is a thermal state. Remember, for a thermal state, you have that the populations are related by the Gibbs ratio. So P is the ground state population. Therefore, 1 minus P, of course, is the excited state population. And so this ratio is, in fact, just this ratio here is E to the plus beta EB, plus because it's ground state divided by excited state. And so this whole thing. Uh, minus, sorry, there was a minus, yes, is equal to minus beta times EB. So we get EB outside here. Okay. Okay. So that gives us a statement, and now I can say the following. So delta S of the system, which is, um, this is now written as an increase in delta S, So one general comment I have to make is that whenever we write thermodynamic uh, equations, typically at the end, we have something in mind, like we want to decrease the entropy or we want to put in work somewhere. And based on that, you can uh, write the quantities in the direction that you like, like whether we are putting work into something or taking them out of something. Having said that, whenever you're working on a particular protocol, it's just easier to begin with to set all of the quantities in one standard thing, like as increase, like delta means an increase in something. And then at the end, interpret it how you like, like use the final equation, say, well, what, what was I looking to decrease or to increase it? So while I'm working on this, everything is increases. So delta S of the system is an increase in that. This we know is minus delta S of the bath. And from this, we just, oh, let me, actually, let me call this a small thing now because this is, for a single step is small change in the bath. 
and this is now equal to beta times EB plus order of delta P squared, so delta P, sorry. I've combined these two equations now, so I know that ds by dp is minus beta eb. I've used, I've used that over here. I've just put minus eb here. And I've put it as delta s of the system because I wanted, I'm, I'm curious to know what delta s of the system is. OK? Is this clear? All right. And so a, yes. OK, so yeah, I can conclude this here. And now I go to another, another one. Sorry, should have sent that board up while I was erasing. Okay, so that was an intermediate calculation that will be useful for us. The reason is because now we want to try to see what W total is. In order to see that, we have to just see what Wn is. So what is the work cost in the end step of this protocol? Um, as before, the energy of the system is, is relevant. The energy of the system is zero always because it's a degenerate system. So this is just delta E of bath N because that's, that's how that changes. And what is that equal to? That is going to be equal to E of bath N times the change, um, let's say, delta P excited. Now I have to keep track. So I said P is the ground state of the bath. So this is all ground state of the bath. Right, OK. Delta P excited of the bath, which is the same as, so minus EBN delta P ground. Just writing ground in excited because I had to put P excited here because it's the energy of the excited state that the population of the excited state contributes to the energy of the path. Okay, so now I just link these two things together. I actually have that this is equal to um, minus the S of the system upon um, beta plus order of dP squared. Okay, and so now I do the whole thing. I say, well, then W total is equal to, I sum this over N, but in every step in N, I just see the nice thing about that quantity now is it just tells me whatever the change in the N state of the bath is, I can link it to what the entropy of the system changed by. So this whole thing now is going to be minus delta S of the system upon beta, and this is the total. Plus, and this is important, I have N steps here, so I'm going to have some N multiplying this, which is order delta P squared. Okay? But here's something important. Well, how do I choose N and delta P? Well, I'm going to choose the number of steps and split the thing in such a way that at the end of all of these steps, my P has changed by the finite amount that I want. So in the case of pure erasure, P changes from half to, to one, if I look at the ground state, or I excited to say it's half to zero. So what I have is that N is of the order of delta p the minus one. Because basically, if I have 100 steps, then I'm going to be changing something of the order of 1 over 100, or half over 100 in each step. So n is of the order of delta p minus, which means that n times order delta p squared is of the order of delta p, or equivalently, um, order of n inverse. Because I can switch between n and delta p basically like this. So this quantity here is of the order of delta P, or more usefully, it's of the order of N inverse, meaning it is a quantity where if I increase the number of steps that I did in this protocol, it is a quantity that will decrease. And so what this tells me is that this quantity, so it goes as N goes to infinity, this just becomes minus delta S, and I'm going to take beta up here now and write it in the form KT minus delta S, which is exactly what we wanted over there. Now remember here, delta S is increased. So if I took delta S as a, de a decrease, then this would be a positive quantity, and I would really get the statement. The amount of work I have to put in is 
kt times the decrease in the entropy of the system, which I can do this now that I finished it. But at the moment, it's still written as an increase in delta s. But it's the same, it's the same formula oh, uh, I, that was written here, but it's erased now. OK, so one thing to mention is that I, when I say plus order delta v squared, this quantity can be negative or positive. It, it's, uh, well, usually when you say something that's ordered v squared, it's negative or positive. Um, you just know that the magnitude is bound by delta p squared. However, we know that there is a bound here, so that fixes what order delta p squared is. So for example, the real quantity here is, in this case here, w total is always going to be this quantity plus something that is positive. You're guaranteed that because we already know that without this, we have the inequality bound, so this must be a positive addition. OK. Um, right, so at the end of this, what we do is we get something that, well, what we were searching for, something that's more efficient than the initial qubit swap that, that I wrote down, because now we have a protocol that will actually use something that is off the order of the same amount of work with some inefficiency and get us the erasure that we want. And what this does is really, as I said before, this is an isothermally, let me call this, this is the classical, or the, sorry, the quantum analog of isothermal. Now, in the form that it is right now, it doesn't appear isothermal because while the system is always very close in state to the bath, it's not actually a thermal state itself. But the important part is that every transformation that is being done is being done between two states that are actually very similar. So whatever the state of the bath that is in contact with the system during this protocol, it has the property that the system is actually very close to that state. So it's the quantum analog of isothermal reversibility somehow. Right. Are there any questions at this point? No? OK, then I think this will be a good point to take a break. And we will uh, resume at 10.35, so seven minutes from now. Good. Thank you. OK, welcome back. Um, yeah, so there was a question asked over Zoom to that person. I, the, the, actually, the second part of the lecture answers that question. I generalize this protocol to different cases. Um, but first, I just want to talk about a few properties of this uh, protocol. So the first property is, how do we make that arrangement? So I said somehow that I start with a Bath uh, Hamiltonian that was very close to the, to the system one. And then I end with the Bath Hamiltonian being whatever I wanted to the final state to be. But how do I go in between these two Hamiltonians is up to me. So for example, I could make this quantified by saying, how do I scale the energy? Like at the end step, what is the energy of the bath that I take? And this is an interesting question that's actually an a important research topic. The one thing one can say is that linear scaling works, but it's not optimal. So I can just take the energy to be n times this little increment and choose the increment so that I go from zero in the beginning to the final Hamilton at the end. Um, and that will work. I can do this calculation in its entirety, and I see that I get the correct answer. But it's not necessarily the optimal. The optimal is one that actually has a curve to it. The energy changes depend on beginning to end. Um, OK. The second thing to say is, in, in the calculation that I just did, I used the differential form of looking at what the error is. So I said that the error is order delta p squared and stuff. You can also look at the integral form of the error. So the way of doing this is to write um, wn as a sum over all of the n steps. And then what you get here is you get a sum that you can write in two ways, and you, you can convert it into, well, you can compare it to an integral. And what you have then is this left and right Riemann sums of a monotonic function, which bound an integral or are bounded by an integral. And using that, you can get a very accurate form of the error. I think that this is in the lecture notes as they are right now. Um, I might have to check that. But yeah, you can, you can do that, and then you, you can actually get an exact form for how big the error can be. The scaling is going to be exactly as you saw in the in the um, argument that I just did, but you can now put constants to it. Um, right, and the third part is just to talk about the reversibility. Basically, what reversibility has done for us, it has changed the um, scaling of these two things. Because when I did a single qubit swap, in one single swap, I, I changed my quantity, like the amount that I wanted, but I had an error that was massive, actually diverged if I wanted to do pure erasure. And the point with the reversibility is by splitting it into a number of smaller steps, what I've done is I've made the change in quantity be equal to some delta, let's say delta of p in this case, but it can be delta s or delta e, whatever you like, whereas this goes as delta p squared. 
And so then when I multiply it over n steps, this becomes of order one, of, of order one, and this over n steps becomes of order delta p itself, which is a small quantity. Or we can also look at it as order n inverse. Okay. So that's the whole point of reversibility. Whatever change you make, um, you make sure that you, you do it in a small enough step, and then with respect to the size of the step, your quantity changes linearly, but your error changes quadratically. Okay. Right. So now that we have that, and maybe I should have erased this board during the break. It was a short break, to be fair. Um, what we're going to discuss now is generalization. So I picked a very simple example. I said my qubit is degenerate in energy, also that my qubit has started in the maximally mixed state, and that I want to erase it. So I want to go to a, essentially as close to the, uh, the ground state of the qubit, or, or rather actually one of the pure states of the qubit as possible. But this is not necessary, and now we're going to discuss what are the generalizations to this protocol that we've just done. And actually, the first generalization is very simple. I can simply run the protocol in reverse. So everything that I did, I just basically did a sequence of unitary operations starting from the initial state of the system with the sequence of the bath. But I can do exactly the opposite. If I give you a system which is in a pure state or close to a pure state, I can now arrange the, well, I just erased it. I can arrange the energies exactly the same way and do the inverse unitary, well, the inverse unitary operation of a swap is also a swap, so it's not actually the inverse. It's just the same unitary. But from the end to the initial state uh, instead of initial to end. And so all this means is... I'm going to be doing the opposite of erasure, so I'm going to be using information, as we discussed in the beginning of the lecture, to actually get work out. Instead of putting in work to erase the state, I will use the, the erased state already to actually extract work. So that is a very simple one. I'm not going to have to do that calculation. Um, OK, what is the second generalization? So let's see. Generalizations. So one is in reverse. So this is now work extraction, because rather than put in work, I've taken work out. So that's very simple. Um, the second now is um, rho s is arbitrary and diagonal. So I keep the Hamilton and the system the same for now. And I just say, well, I don't have to start the system in the maximally mixed state. Maybe I used it in some complicated measurement, and the reduced state of the system, system is not actually maximally mixed. It's some diagonal state. and it has some ratio between one of the states and the other states of the population, but I do want to erase it. I want to get it mostly in one state and not the other. So how do I, how do, I do this now? Well, let me draw for reference. So I had my, my bath, bath sequence, and it was basically, I, I had, let me call this B0, which is not actually involved. It's really a, a degenerate bath, and then there was something, and there was something more, dot, 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 there's something intermediate, and then there's the final, so bath final, bath n, uh, actually, bath zero, let's say, bath one. Okay, this is my sequence of baths, and, and, I, and in my original protocol, I brought in the system. The system was basically of the form that its state was going to be, this, it was a maximum mixed state, so it would be the same as a bath state with a degenerate Hamiltonian. So I, this is just as a reference point. I started swapping with one, two, three, and till the end. Now, if I start the system as something arbitrary, which is not the maximum mixed state, well, the answer how to do it is very simple. I still want reversibility to hold true. So I want that wherever I start, it should have the property that the system is very close to the bath state. So all I do then is I just find the bath state here, where B, M, so let's put it this way, tau M is approximately the same as rho system. And then I start at m plus 1. 
So I find the bath state that is actually the same as the system where if I swap, nothing would happen. And then I start the protocol from there because my system is already at that point. So now I can proceed from that point onwards. What does this correspond to mathematically? Well, so if my row system is equal to P0, 0, 0, 0 plus P1, 1, 1, then this defines a Gibbs ratio. So P1 by P0 is going to be some Gibbs ratio, and I can write it as e to the minus beta times e, let's say, e bath um, m. I'm just going to label it. Oh, actually, no, let's just say e bath, e bath 0, let's say. So this Gibbs ratio defines an energy of the bath for which the thermal state of the bath would have exactly the same as this one, as the, as the state of the system. And now that becomes my reference point. That is now bath 0. So it will be something over here. And then I start the protocol from there. If I'm doing erasure, I go in the right direction. If I'm doing work extraction, I go in the left direction. So the generalization of the first step still works. But all I've done is I've started from a new reference point. The new reference point is just defined by reversibility. Is this clear? Is there a, que is there a question here? No. Good. All right. Now, so this is now. To start energy. Okay, now my third generalization is HS is not equal to zero. So what happens now? So my first and second generalization means I can do it in either direction. I can start in any state of the system. Still diagonal. The reason for that is if I want to uh, operate with off diagonal systems with coherences between energy, I need another resource in order to do this. And that's something that's the topic of the next lecture. So I won't get that into that today. Um, so we're still doing diagonal systems. But imagine now that my Hamilton of the system is actually not zero. Okay. So this is now interesting because I, um, depending on what I do, I would not even call it erasure. So for example, um, if I want to go to row system prime is zero, zero of the system, where now zero is really the low energy state, we always use that thing, then this is cooling. I mean, it is erasure in a certain sense because it's also a pure state among a two-level system. But thermodynamically, you can also call it cooling because you've put more population in the in the ground state. Um, okay, so that, the opposite is still work extraction. So the the opposite thing is still working. Ah, actually, the opposite thing is, and I would call it an engine. Because in the opposite case, what I'm I would say is, imagine I have a system that starts in the state zero, and I take it to the maximally mixed state and I extract work from it. Well, what I'm doing is basically, I have an environment temperature. I have my state, which starts very cold. I put take energy from the environment to the very cold state, bringing it to another temperature. And in doing so, I extract, I extract work. So I've actually run an engine between two temperatures. So this is just semantics. At the basis of it, it's still the same. OK, so what do I do here? Again, it's actually the same thing as I do in the second, second case. So the Hamiltonian of the system is actually irrelevant to tell me what the start of the protocol is. The start of the protocol is always done by saying that the starting state of the bath that I match the system should be approximately the same as the system state. So I'm going to do the same thing as I did in the second generalization. I just start where the system state is approximately the same as tau. Okay? The thing that changes now is that because the Hamiltonian of the system is non-zero, my energy of the system as well changes. So what I'm going to get, so let me call this. Right. So what this is going to do in this case is that the W total, which is sum over n Wn, is now going to be equal to, I can write it as sum over n, delta um, right, delta in the n step of E s plus the delta in the n step of E of the bath, basically. So this term we had last time. This term is new. But this is fine, because the whole point about the term that was delta EB, so uh, let's, say delta, let's put the sum both ways. This is kind of nice, because delta ES is just this thing that we keep adding from the beginning to the end. I don't have to keep track of it in the middle, because energy is, I mean, it's, a, uh, it's not a part-dependent quantity. So this whole thing is just going to be delta ES total. I just call it delta total somehow here of ES from beginning to end. 
And that one is still the same. The, the calculation that we did the last time remains the same. Delta EB is just related to the populations in EB. That is still related. To say it gives us the entropy change of EB, which is the same as entropy change of ES, because that is just a thing that we derive from the fact that we just swap two states. So whatever entropy change on one side is the same as the other side. So that quantity is still going to be the same. And we can write it as minus delta SS total um, upon beta. And then this is just, uh, then we have, of course, the order of delta P squared. Oh, sorry, um, n times order of delta P. So I'm just going to write the final thing, which is order n inverse. OK? And this is very nice, because this is the definition of free energy, delta Fs. Um, note that I think when I did the entropy calculation, I actually didn't include k already, which is why um, I have beta here, because otherwise I might have had, um, yeah, it's, Sometimes I use k, sometimes I don't use k, but just keep track of that. So it's delta Fs is actually e minus t delta s, whereas here you might think, well, because of beta, I actually get a k constant here as well. But it's fine. If delta s is the von Neumann entropy, then it will be multiplied by something different. If it's the thermodynamic entropy, it already has k in it. So if k is equal to 1, if we are working in those units, then you don't have to think about this. Anyway, the final thing is that if the qubit is not degenerate, the protocol actually remains the same. All of the properties are the same. The only thing is that instead of the entropy of the system being the relevant quantity that, that determines how much work we need to put in, now it's the free energy of the system. So this actually shows you how the, well, this is one example of how the free energy terms comes to be the defining thermodynamic quantity. So the end result is that if we, if we were to do the Maxwell's demon uh, thing that we had, but with energies for the system as well, this is something you will do in a tutorial question, you would actually get the, the bound that W is greater uh, or equal to delta Fs of the system. I see. That would be the equation in that case. OK. Are there any questions here? Nope. All right. Very good. So then we go to the next part of Thing. We discussed all of the generalizations. Yes. Right. But OK, one thing I would say is just to summarize all of these generalizations, in the end, you can always look at it as the following. So you have two cases. So case one, rho s is in equilibrium. And then you take out of equilibrium. And this is work extraction. Oh, sorry, in, uh, this is um, yeah, out of equilibrium. So this you can be erasure or cooling. Or a general term for this is just, um, let me write it down in another class. Essentially, this is just state preparation. I want rho to be of a certain form. I want to take it from an equilibrium state to out of equilibrium. That's one thing. And case two, which is the converse, rho s out of equilibrium. And you want to take it to equilibrium. And this is just work extraction. And every thermal machine basically works on this principle. You have two resources. So in the case of something that you run between two baths, they are each in equilibrium, but they're not in equilibrium with each other. So by taking some systems which are out of e equilibrium with respect to the other bath and putting them in the other bath, you generate a flow that you extract work from. And so this is now um, exactly what we do here. OK. And so to the next part of the lecture, which is work storage systems. Right. Um, so far, everything that I've done has not really included the work storage system explicitly. What I've done essentially is I've said, I have a system, I have a memory. So, so far, I've had some row, system, memory, bath, whatever it is. And then I do, sorry, I do a unitary on it. And then I get some final thing, row prime. 
S M B, and I just go, well, the work is just the difference in energy of this. So trace of H total rho prime S M B minus rho S M B. Okay, so I've just it's it's not it's not a wrong assumption to make, it's the appropriate assumption. If I do a unitary operation, then the change in energy of the system I should associate to work. But now I would like to go beyond this because I want to actually have everything that I use in this protocol included in the protocol itself. Also, I want to see what a work storage system for quantum mechanics would look like. So the new thing that I want to do now is to say I have rho s, let's say memory, path, and work system. So I'm going to have a quantum system as the work. And I'm going to do a u and a u dagger, but these are going to be... Um, energy preserving. And what does energy preserving mean? This is the thing that we discussed at the beginning of the course. U comma H total, the commutator is zero. So in the new paradigm, I want it to be the case that I do a unitary that on the global thing is energy preserving. So there is no energy that is put in from an external source into these components. Right, okay, so what can such a, such a work storage be? Um, I will do one example of it, but to, I want to discuss a general principle of it first. So let's think about it classically. So classical work. So for classical work, I can have something like a weight, you know, that I just I hang. So this is now a, a weight. And then I can do a thermodynamic protocol where I raise the weight if I want to extract work from a system, or I lower the weight when I want to do work on the system. And it has the following properties. It has that S of the weight, I can see, so this is now the entropy, is equal to S prime of the weight, which is equal to zero. And also that implies that delta S of the weight is equal to zero. So it has these two properties. You, typically I just, I know where the weight is, and I also know where the weight is finally, so the entropy is always zero, which also implies that the, the change in entropy is zero. Now the point is one of these is critical for thermodynamics and the other is not. The critical one is this one here and not this one. So as an ana analogy, imagine that it's, I have a system that's connected to this hanging weight, but I can't actually see where the weight is. I'm not exactly sure where the weight is and where it isn't, but I do a thermodynamic protocol and I know that at the end of it, the weight has been lowered by 10 meters. Now this is important. It means that I might know, not, not know where the weight is in the beginning. I might not know where the weight is at the end. But whatever the state was, I know that it's changed by 10 meters. So it does not satisfy the first thing because I have an entropy in the weight, but it does satisfy the second. So it is important. The most important part about thermo thermodynamic work is that the entropy change should be zero. And this has some consequences now when we think about quantum work because There are multiple versions of quantum work. You could, for example, think of, I want to store quantum work, so I'm going to just take a number of qubits, which are, for example, in any state that you want, and I'm going to consider that they are useful for work or they can act as a battery if I put them all in the excited state. So I consider work, this is a answer, it's a guess. I'm going to be, I'm going to say that a battery, a quantum battery is just a collection of qubits all in the excited state. This is not exactly a good definition of work, or rather it, it can be, but you have to now be careful because if I start from a qubit, let's say rho w is equal to one, one, and then I extract a little bit of work from it, I just go, let's say rho w prime is equal to some epsilon zero, zero plus one minus epsilon one, one, okay? So it started in a completely excited state, and then I go to this, so I've taken some population in the ground state while doing something else. Here, delta S of the weight is not equal to zero, and is in fact, for small epsilon, it's, it's in, it diverges. Well, not diverges, sorry. It, um, it has infinite slope at epsilon goes to zero. And the reason for this is, you know that um, the S, if I, if I draw S for a qubit, so S versus... Um, P, and this is half, this is one, 
and this is zero, so p of the ground state or p of the excited state doesn't matter. The graph that you have is something like this. And it is here, it is infinite slope. Okay. So actually, the, the, um, the um, yeah, so the problem with treating this as a work storage is it looks like it's very good. It, it has the property that the entropy is zero, which is what you might go, oh, that's what I need for a, for a work source. The entropy of the work should be zero. But the problem is that when you change the state, the entropy changes massively, and the slope of the entropy change versus the change in the energy is infinite at that point. So it's actually not very good. So in fact, a better place to get your work storage system would be at this point, which is a maximally mixed, mixed state. And here you see why. If I have a maximally mixed state and I change its state by epsilon, for small epsilon, actually, the entropy doesn't change because I, I'm at this point of the slope. So the maximally mixed state is one, which has the maximum entropy that you can think of. But it also has the property that when you change the state a little bit, you're actually not going to change the entropy much. So it has, so, and that is the one that is more critical for us. Because remember, the, this is also in contrast with a bath. Right? A bath was exactly the quantity where, when the entropy changed, it would change by the maximum amount possible by Jane's principle, whereas the work is at the other extreme. Whatever energy change you have, you have no, no change in the entropy. OK, so having said that, let me now talk about the work storage system that we actually can use in the protocol that we just had. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to define the following Hamiltonian. So HW is equal to x, so g of x, let's call this g times x, where g is some constant. I mean, I can write mgx, and this really looks like a weight. Mass of the weight, g is the gravitational constant, and x is the height. So it really is, it is the analog of a weight. Okay. And if I wrote this in, in diagram form, which I do sometimes, it, I wouldn't be able to because this is a continuous variable. But I could, I could sort of go, this is sort of the the sort of Hamiltonian of the weight. It's just, it's, just a, it's a ladder, but it's a continuous ladder. So that I'm, even though I draw it discrete, it has all of the spectrum in between. OK. A very important um, operation on, on this is the translation operation. So the translation operation A is the one that takes x of the weight to x plus A of the weight. So this is, again, this is all just continuous position momentum sort of mathematics, but I, I define by this notation the translation on the weight. Okay. All right. So now I, I have this definition of the weight. I can consider, well, how do I use this weight to take everything that I did before and make it um, in the new sort of paradigm that I only use energy preserving unitaries on everything, including the weight. So what was my initial unitary? I can write my unitary in this form. So I can write it as. Um, let's say E I of the system E B oh, sorry E G let's say I J of the bath and E K of the system E L of the bath tensor tensor okay. I construct it this way. A more neater way to put it would be E I E K, the, the ket bra and E J E L. But this is just to say this it transforms um, E K E L into E I E J, and then I can have a sum over these uh, quantities C I J K L I J K L, and the property that so for, I'm going to take the swap for example. And in the swap, I know that there are some states that flip. Like in the case of the um, just two qubits, I know that 0, 1 flips with 1, 0. But 0, 0 and 1, 1 remain the same. So in the case of the swap, I really have that C, I, J, K, L is equal to either 0 or 1 for every one of them. So either, a, um, yeah, either I switch a state to something else, or I never switch the state, um, and it remains the same. So C, I, J, K, L is just, it's actually the matrix, this matrix is um, sort of a permutation matrix. There are some states that say the same. There are some states that flip. Okay. 
So now this is clearly not energy preserving because EK plus EL can be different from EI plus EJ. So the initial state, this is like this is somehow the initial part of the state. I can think of e each of these terms in the unitary takes this one and goes there. And so the initial energy here is so the transformation is that EK of the system plus EL of the bath goes to EI of the system plus EJ of the bath. And so to make it a, um, a unit uh, energy preserving transformation now, I do something very simple. I combine this with the translation operator, and I, I will write it again fully, but what I just do is I combine this now with the translation operator on the weight, and I want to make the translation exactly equal to what, um, so actually, okay. You know what, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna work in units where G is equal to one, otherwise G will just keep appearing everywhere. So the energy is just X, the units are normalized to that. And so I want to translate the weight by exactly the energy change here so that the total change is zero. So I know that the, the energy went from E, from this one to that one in the system, so the weight should decrease by that amount. So this should be EK plus EL S B minus EI S minus E J B. So the final state of the system and bath in each of these terms has increased by this much, but the weight has decreased by that much. Okay? And now one thing that is very easy to prove is to show that this one here satisfies that U comma H S B plus H of the weight is equal to zero. Is there any question here? OK, yes, so where was I? Yes, so indeed. So this is now, at this stage, we've done step one. We've said, well, I had first a unitary protocol that, I, that was um, arbitrary. Um, well, it was not arbitrary entirely, because it, we were not going to work, um, we're not going to, in the case of the qubit swaps, we were not doing um, coherent unitaries. They, they were always sort of swapping states completely. Um, and I can make it energy preserving by simply saying every time I have a swap between two states of different energies, I just attach that to a translation of the weight. Okay. Now, this is all good, except the following. Now, this unitary here is a unitary on the system, on the bath, and on the weight. Okay. So the immediate question would be, well, if I do a unitary on the system, bath, and weight, it's going to make some changes to the weight as well. Whatever the initial state of the weight was, it's going to change. There are going to be some correlations that happened because of the system and bath being um, interacting with the weight. So as an example, let's just do this for the simple swap. So for the qubit swap, okay? So the qubit swap is going to be now of this form. So U is going to be the following. So it's going to be one, zero, zero, one on the system bath tensored with the translation. So this, in, in this unitary operation, these, in this part of the unitary, the system goes from 0 to 1, so it increases in energy by yes, and the bath goes from 1 to 0. So the translation of the weight should be exactly the opposite, so it's EB minus ES. And so you can see that it, it uh, corresponds. Then you have the Hermitian conjugate of this. So 0, 1, 1, 0, tensor gamma of ES minus EB, and then you have the terms where nothing happens. Zero, 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 tensor identity on the weight, plus one, 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 tensor identity on the weight. Okay, so that is an example of this. Just associate every, every change in the system and path to the corresponding change in the, in the weight. Now, what is going to happen? So imagine now I start with rho system bath is equal to something. I don't even, I don't need to write this in full detail. I'm just going to write down symbolically um, C11 and zero in the rest. Okay, so it's that tensored a state of the weight. Okay. So rho system bath weight initial, let's say. 
Then what is row system bath weight final? And now the point is that I can do this unitary operation. And what's going to happen is corresponding to every term, I'm going to have a, a different change on the weight. So this thing, which started as a tensor product between system bath and weight, is now going to split into four terms, each that involves the system bath and the weight. So it's going to be P00 is going to be 0, 0, 0, 0. Tensor row of the weight again. Um, the same thing with actually P11, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, also tensor row of the weight. But now we have a problem because we have P01 with uh, 0, 1 is, yeah, 0, 1, 0, 1. You get into 0, so P, oh, I'm sorry. Nope, you've, you've, you've done the unitary operation. So P01 is with 1, 0, 1, 0. And this is going to be gamma rho weight, gamma dagger. What is the thing with P01 going to 1, 0, gamma EB minus ES? So EB minus ES, EB minus ES. Incidentally, just <laughs> I should be clear, um, this is just gamma ES minus EB. Gamma dagger is, is just the inverse translation. And then I have P10, the last one, 0, 1, 1, 0, tensor gamma ES minus EB, row weight, gamma dagger, ES minus EB. Okay, and now I thought that example was going to be small, but I'm going to need a new board. Okay, so maybe, maybe okay, I continue this here just so that I don't have to look from one end of the board to the other. Um, right, so what I'm interested in is to see how the weight has changed. So the final state of the weight, rho prime, which is going to be the trace over all of this, you trace out the system and the bath, so all of those terms will, be, will disappear, but those probabilities will remain, is going to be P00 plus P11, I'm going to have rho weight with P01. I'm going to have this gamma rho weight gamma dagger. I'm just going to call this a some delta. Doesn't matter what it is. And then with P10, gamma of minus delta rho weight gamma dagger of delta. Okay? Now, this can be a problem because now ima imagine that, so let's take this, let's say case one. Row weight, I started in a perfect state. So let's say x equals to zero, x equals to zero. Okay, so I started the weight in a, in a delta function at x equals to zero. It's like perfectly in the middle of the ladder. And then I put it on, over this thing and I have this mixture. Then, then row weight prime is going to be this thing. So, well, Rho weight prime is going to be a mixed state. And the important thing about these mixed states is that each one of these states, rho weight, rho weight shifted um, states, they are going to be orthogonal to each other. Because if I start with x rho weight being a delta function, and then I translate it up, or I translate it down, I'm going to get another delta function, which is going to be orthogonal to the initial state. So the rho weight final, so I could say this, the rho weight final prime is mixed, and the entropy, actually, so the entropy of the weight final would actually be the entropy of this distribution. Would be, if I did this, it's a probability distribution over these three. So I'll have P00 plus P11 log of P00 plus P11 plus P01 log P01 plus the same thing, P10 log P10 with, of course, a giant minus sign on the whole thing. But SW initial was zero. And so this is a problem because I just said, I want to start with this, um, the main thing that defines a good state of the weight is that the entropy of the state of the weight should not change as a result of using it because if it does, then it's not really a good source of work. So this is not a good, not a good idea. So not good work storage. How do I make it a good work storage system? Well, I take the following. 
So case, uh, well, actually, this I will now write in a new thing, so you don't need it so much. So good work storage system. system is where raw weight is a broad state. What does a broad state mean? So for example, this row weight is equal to psi weight, psi weight, where psi itself is equal to, so let's, let's say, so psi x, which is a wave function, is a broad thing. So I can take it as being, let's say, um, one over, I hope I use the same thing that we'll be using in the tutorial, one over square root of two L for minus L less than zero, uh, less than X, less than L and zero otherwise. Okay, so this corresponds really to, yeah, this is a so psi of X versus X. This would just be a box minus L plus L. So it's a broad state in this box. Now, why is this a better state than that? Well, intuitively, the answer is clear. When I take this state and I make a translation on it, if the translation is not too large, it actually has a very large overlap with what the initial state is. So now if I make L very large, what happens is that the overlap between the initial state, so each of these states now, the, the state of the weight and the translated state of the weights are not orthogonal anymore, or not necessarily orthogonal. If X, if the, not X, sorry, if this delta which is what I shifted the wave function, the weight is, is much smaller than the value of L, then actually the overlap between these two wave functions is going to be quite high. And so then the density matrix at the end will not actually split into just four terms that are orthogonal to each other. They will in fact be very close to the original density matrix. This is something I will not do in detail because again, it is a tutorial question, but the end point of this is to say, if your state of your system is a broad pure state, and by broad, I mean it has to be much broader than whatever energy changes you are going to induce on the state, then you will have, so as L, so, so for, let's say, delta E of the system bath, much less than L, what you end up getting is that rho W prime is approximately the same as rho W. Because the shift, a shifted thing which is very broad, the overlap is, is of the order of basically so the overlap um, psi weight and psi prime weight will be of the order of one minus delta by L. There may be a square root here, I'm not sure. But again, okay, this is a tutorial question. I will not go into that in detail. But yeah, so this is a good work storage system. Something which is broad enough that you do not change in weight. Something that we'll do in the next class is also to consider working with coherences and we will will actually again use the system because it's not only is it broad in energy, it's also very highly coherent. Because I haven't taken a mixture of all of the X states from minus L to L, I've really taken the a coherent wave function from minus L to L. So it has a lot of phase information in it as well. Okay, is there any question? All right, good, so then to end the lecture, I'm going to do a small thing that I will then generalize in the next one. So erasure and correlations. And in this lecture, I will just do a simple example of this. And in the next thing, next lecture, we will do, um, I will talk about the general statement um, and about coherence manipulation. Right. So everything that I've talked about so far is erasure on a single system. I had the state of the system in the beginning and um, I wanted to take it to another state, either in, in equilibrium to out of equilibrium or the reverse thing, okay? But now I can consider, well, actually, what I have is a system that I want to erase, but it starts in a joint state with something else. So I'm going to have rho SA is my initial state, initial state of S and A. So this now is some ancilla. And I have access to the ancilla, means I can do stuff on, on both the system and the ancilla, but I don't really care about the final state of the ancilla. And what I want to do is I want to, the task is to erase 
just raw, just to erase the system. Okay. So, which means I want to take row S, which remember is trace of row system ancilla. I want to take it to, well, or epsilon close to zero, zero of the system. Okay. Now, what I did in the previous part of the lecture already works for this. Like, no matter what the ancilla is, I can, for starters, I can just ignore it. Just be like, whatever it is, doesn't matter. I take the reduced state of the system, I see what the reduced state of the system is, and I do erasure on the reduced state of the system, and I, everything that we talked about before works. So let me talk about this example. Um, actually, I'm going to have three examples. So case one, row system ancilla is equal to, uh, uh, I need to, let me write all three cases first because I want to do it reverse. Case two and case three. So in case three, row system ancilla is the phi plus state. Plus phi, phi plus. Phi plus, yeah. Phi plus. Phi plus system ancilla, which if you recall is, I hope this is phi plus. If it's not, somebody please tell me. So zero, zero plus one, one uh, upon square root of two times its complex conjugate. Zero, zero, omission conjugate rather, one, 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 two. That's case three, so row system ancilla is, um, is a, well, it's an entangle, it's a bell state. Case two is that row system ancilla is a correlated state, so it's equal to zero, 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 plus one, 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 half, multiplying the whole thing, that's case two. And then case one is, okay, case one is the very simple one. Zero, zero, plus one, one on the system upon two. So this is identity on the system. Tends to the same thing on the path. So zero, zero on the path plus one, one on the path times one over two. Okay. I have these three cases of what the system and ancilla can start off with. The first thing I want you to notice about all three cases is that for all of them, rho system is equal to identity over two. Because the first one is very simple. It's a product state of identity times identity, so of course it's true. But even in the second case, when you trace out the, the ancilla, you're going to get an equal mixture of zero and one in the system. And the same thing happens for the bell states. You know this for the bell states. The reduced marginals of the bell states are the maximally mixed state. That's how you know that they're maximally entangled states. So in all three cases, the initial state of the system is just identity over two, which means that if we ignore the ancilla in this case and we just do erasure as we know it from before, then all of these three cases are indistinguishable because the system is just identity over two. But now what happens if we do not ignore the ancilla? And this is now the clever thing that we can do. So. OK, so the important part about using the fact that we have access to the ancilla is we do not care what the final state of the ancilla is. And in particular, oh wait, was I supposed to stop at 11.20, not 11.30? Right. OK, I forgot about that. We're looking at the clock. So I'm going to say one statement at the end. Um, well, maybe you can think about it. I will revisit it in the next class. So in each of these three cases, I can do something different. Case one is just normal erasure. In case two, I can do a unitary operation on the system and ancilla to start off with that will turn it to, into something that's similar to case one. But by doing that unitary operation, I will basically have done erasure already, and then I can use the ancilla to extract work. And in case three, I can actually, so let's put it this way. Case one has a erasure cost. Case two actually does have, has zero erasure cost, at least by the Maxwell's demon bound. And case three has a negative erasure cost in the sense that I can erase the state of the system. I can have it end up in zero while actually extracting work. 
And the key to do that is before you start the process of erasure in every case, you should first do a appropriate unitary operation. And then after you do a unitary operation, you can do either erasure or work extraction of the system or the ancilla. You can think about that, but we will continue this in the next lecture. Sorry for the delay, and thank you.